We have uh, here with us Ethan Tyler Graham from Ave Maria, Florida. And Tyler has kindly agreed to speak with us about his encounter with Professor Rene Girard, which he encountered in Stanford. And I would like to ask you, Tyler, how did you first uh, hear about Professor Girard? My junior year at Stanford, um, I, was, I was probably working with you on something related to theater at the time. And I remember you, you talking to me about Girard and you know, I desire what you desire and you know, <laughs> romantic desire. I didn't make much of it, but somehow I got a hold of Deceit Desire in the novel. And that summer, um, in the midst of what probably would be described as a kind of existential crisis, kind of um, end of my, my thinking of sort of atheist nihilism that had, that had been developing over years, uh, reading Deceit Desire in the novel was a kind of demythologization of that. And, um, and I, I think it was, it was the beginning of, uh, of my conversion to be a, a Girardian, I guess you might say. So when did you meet uh, Professor Girard? So uh, for my senior year at Stanford, which technically at that point, I think, uh, technically that was his last official year. He, he officially retired, but I mean, he kept, he kept on doing stuff for many, many years after that. Um, so that would have been 1995, the 94-95 um, year. He taught three courses. Uh, he taught one on the Bible, one on Shakespeare, and one on the novel. And I took all three of those classes and asked him to be one of my readers for my honors thesis on a, on a novel by William Faulkner. What did you write your honors thesis on? So I did a mimetic reading of the novel, The Sound and the Fury, which seemed at the time, I'm still more or less convinced of it, it, it was a kind of first breakthrough novel for Faulkner, and it seemed like he was going through some of the same phenomena that writers Girard was interested in that would have what he called the novelistic conversion. I think the essay ended up being called novelistic conversion in the sound of the fury or something like that. Um, but that was the basic idea. I was trying to see if Faulkner was using some of the characters in the novel and their mimetic dynamics to show some of his own sort of movement out of uh, mimetic enslavement in some respects. Okay, so it looks like uh, uh, you had some uh, strong working with René Girard, Professor Girard. So um, how did he influence you personally? Yeah, I mean, I, I could go on and on for the ways he has influenced me personally. I mean, to pick, I guess to pick three categories, I'd go with the intellectual and professional, the spiritual and the religious, and then maybe the personal. I think intellectually and professionally, uh, he certainly shaped my thinking in most of my work that I've done in academia. I'm a high school teacher, but I've published many essays over the last couple decades, and almost all of them have had something to do with the mimetic theory. An essay on Girard and, and Durkheim, an essay on Girard and St. Augustine, an essay on Gerard and Dostoevsky and Pope John Paul II. So I mean, an essay on Gerard in Catholic school teaching. You know, it, his framework has so profoundly influenced my intellectual life and professional life that um, I'm completely indebted to him for that. Especially even as a teacher, uh, guiding my thinking and teaching about mimetic dynamics has been um, extremely important. Uh, high school teaching is, is a very mimetic phenomenon. There's, there's no question about that. I, I'm now finishing. I've been uh, teaching for over two decades now, so I'm, I'm convinced of that. I think spiritually, uh, it's no coincidence that within, I don't know, within by, by that January or February of my senior year at Stanford, I'd had a conversion to Christianity, and then, um, and then the next year was entered the Catholic Church. Uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that the mimetic theory was deeply linked to opening up the Bible and the Christian tradition for me. And 
uh, leading me from atheism to Christianity, I still see many aspects of the faith through a Girardian lens. Um, and uh, so I'm completely indebted to Girard for that. I think personally, uh, when, I, when I think of my memories of him as a, as a person, as a mentor to myself and, and all the other Girardians I've met, yourself and many people at places like Cover, um, Colloquium on Violence Religion, uh, I think that the thing that stands out the most as sort of the defining thing I'm, I would most want to imitate in Gerard was his joy and happiness. I think he was someone who understood profoundly how the forces he was studying of, of modern mimetic enslavement could lead to unhappiness in so many different ways. And he was profoundly attentive to them in modeled a way to remain joyful and um, more or less free, or at least trying to become free as best as he could from, from, the, from the mimetic dynamics that he found himself in. Um, there, was a, there was a great compassion in him and a great joy uh, that came from his, his own personal uh, following of Christ and uh, studying of, <laughs> of mimetic desire. Wonderful. Um, do you have any uh, recollection of yourself uh, talking to him and him telling you something? Yeah, I mean, but many. What was one piece of advice that he gave you that you still remember? Uh, a piece of advice? I remember when I first started um, high school teaching, he said, don't get involved with the politics. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, and I remember when I first started to, I was so influenced by, I, I would find myself when I would teach and, you know, I would start talking about medics and my hand would do this. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was his movement, you know, when he would when give his lectures uh, or he'd start talking about the mimetic stuff, you know, oh, you know, it's, it's you know, completely mimetic. You know, my hand would come around. And so that, that had been imitated. I remember his class on Shakespeare when he would lecture, it was like he was levitating. I don't know. I, I don't remember know. that too. Absolutely. There, there, I, it, it's hard to explain, but um, there, were, there was such a uh, uh, life in him that was uh, captivating. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess if we, had, if we had time, I could unpack many pieces of advice or snippets. I would... I'll go to office hours and meet with him a lot when I was trying to still figure out the mimetic theory and it was very helpful and you know unpacking that for somebody in my position, you know, kind of a undergrad. You know, he was obviously by the time I met him, he had been, I don't know how many PhDs he had, and he was working with major professors. So um I was a I was a smaller, <laughs> smaller box to fill there. Good. Well, thank you for taking your time and agreeing to do this interview with us and uh, much appreciated.